talked about the whole subject when God seems late. And I know it's been really our series of when God doesn't make sense. It's been kind of a difficult element of series as far as sometimes the things that we've been talking about are difficult sometimes to swallow, but they are so real as it relates to life. And even though last week was kind of difficult, we talk about when God seems late, we really we are talking about something that I think is a little even more difficult. Because the fact of the matter is, when God seemed late with uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, God eventually does exactly what they're asking him to. And Lazarus rises from the dead, and we're like, wow, that's awesome. But what do you do when God seems uncooperative or Put it another way, what do you do when God seems to say no? So I want to talk about the subject when, when, when God doesn't seem to make sense, and it seems as though God is uncooperative. I know you're, you're believing. You recognize that with God, nothing is too difficult. Know that the hand of the Lord is not waxed short. You're praying about it. You're believing God for it, and you're trusting that he's going to do something, but it seems as though God isn't going to. To do it. It's my prayer that we pray as well as grow in understanding our willingness to surrender to the will of God in our lives. That we learn to be dependent upon Him, that He is the one He's in control. Say, for instance, just like what recently happened 47 years old, 46 years old, falls over in their backyard with. A wife of 20 years and three children. And we're praying and believing God for a miraculous intervention. And instead of a miraculous intervention, Tim Williams steps into eternity. And if you're maybe with me, you go, God, that doesn't make sense to me. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? There are times that it just seems like God doesn't make sense. Because you think about it, God, I, we used to call them gyro spots. Anybody know what I'm talking about? God gives you like the spot right next to the front door at the mall. We call that a gyro spot. So God, you'll give me the parking spot, but I've been praying that you deliver me from my migraines. But instead, it doesn't seem to be happening. God, I'm praying for you to restore my marriage, but it doesn't seem like it's taking place. God, I'm praying that you do something about my parents' marriage relationship, but it doesn't seem to be happening. God, I'm praying that you deliver me from this pain, but it doesn't seem like it's happening. You have maybe an ongoing challenge of a job. God, I know that you're Jehovah Jireh, but it seems as though Nothing is happening. And no matter who you are, from time to time, I believe that as individuals, we come to a place where we maybe don't necessarily understand God, and God seems to be uncooperative. You'll be here. Come on, wave at me if you know what I'm talking about. So I want to talk about that as a very difficult kind of thing. You, I mean, you realize that God can do it because for him, there's nothing too difficult. You're praying and believing that God can and will, but he doesn't seem to be doing it. And God seems to be uncooperative. You're a sincere follower of Jesus, but it doesn't seem to be happening. Today, I want to look at the life of Apostle Paul or a segment from Apostle Paul's life. Some of you may be familiar with him. He ended up, he was Saul of Tarsus, who was, he hated Christians because of their, uh, their, their faith and the, because of their ideas. And so he persecuted the, the people who were followers of Jesus Christ and he was consenting to their death. He ended up kind of chasing them down with authority from the Sanhedrin to have them arrested. But he has a miraculous intervention by God in Acts chapter 9 where he's knocked off of his horse he's blinded and he is miraculously converted Paul then goes from hating Christians to becoming one and an amazing leader in the church he's an amazing preacher phenomenally impacts the known world with the message of Jesus Christ, travels for almost 20 years declaring the message of Jesus, establishing churches, and he's bringing the gospel to Europe. He wrote half, uh, over half of the New Testament. He took the gospel to Europe. He was stoned for his faith. He was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by snakes. He He was stoned and left for dead, but thankfully, like Wesley and Princess Bride, he was only mostly dead. He was raised again. He was lifted up. 
He was beaten 39 times, or 39, with 39 lashes, five times. And you may or may not know this, but anybody who was whipped with 40 lashes, if they ended up dying, it was considered murder. But if you did 39 and they ended up dying, it was still okay. Paul was beaten. He suffered. He was put in prison over and over again. And we're going to go to the book of 2 Corinthians because Paul is an amazing figure in the New Testament. He's an amazing figure with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's an amazing leader. If there's anyone who deserved to have prayers answered, we would think it would be Paul. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it's going to be a fairly lengthy portion of scripture, so please hang with me. So wave at me when you get there, would you? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, some of you over there, some, some of you haven't gotten there yet, so okay, here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, he says, it is doubtless uh, not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure uh, by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest... I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. It will not return void. It will accomplish what you please. It will prosper in the thing wherein you send it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. And I pray today in the name of Jesus that I'd be able to deliver your word, that we could be transformed and leave this place more like you. And when sometimes it seems like, Lord, you don't make any sense, we can still trust in knowing that you are God who is in control and you are God who is good. So help us in this moment, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul penning to the church at Corinth, he's talking about the element of his thorn in the flesh. Uh, scholars for years have debated about what Paul's thorn is. It's never really been definitive, and so therefore my goal here is not to explain to you what Paul's thorn is. I want to talk about the fact that Paul is an individual who is an amazing leader, who if we're talking about the element of prayer and having prayer answered, he would be one that we would go, yeah, he's done so many amazing things. Let me answer his prayer. In fact, uh, the Greek word for the element of thorns is scholars, which means a pointed piece of wood. Pale, a stake, a sharp stake, a splinter. Has anybody here ever been out? You know, maybe, maybe, how many are, are, are country folks? How many don't know what country is? Anybody here been in a thorn, a, a briar patch? Been in, in element of thorns? You know what I'm talking about? You know, you're just kind of walking along, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, ah! Right? The thorn. It's, so, it's a sharp object. It's, it's, it's intended to inflict an element of pain. The Bible tells us that Paul was tormented by his thorn. In fact, the, the New King James uses the term buffet. It's the Greek word uh, kalphazio, and so, which means that to strike with a fist. It means to give one a blow with the fist, to maltreat. Paul is talking about something that's extremely significant. We know that, uh, we, we don't necessarily know what it is, but what we do know is that the Bible indicates that God allowed that to take place in Paul's life. 
And what we're, what we're recognizing, it was something that really afflicted Paul. It was something that buffeted him. He prayed about it three times, and yet God was uncooperative and said, no, I'm not going to remove it. That brings me to one of the points that I want us to, to get into our spirit, and it's the recognition that true prayer isn't about getting our way, but surrendering our will to God. I've said it a number of times over the years, and I know that it may even bring me not going to hoot and holler about my message today, but it's the element of life. The reality is, is that, I've said it before, the name of Jesus is not a rabbit's foot. Prayer is not a rabbit's foot. We do not always get everything that we want. God is the king. He is the one who is in control. He is the Lord, and we recognize, even as we've been saying, I want to bring it back to our attention, we do not interpret God's goodness through our circumstances. We interpret our circumstances through God's goodness. God is good all the time. No matter the circumstances of my life, God is good. And I recognize that he is in control of my life. And true prayer isn't about me getting what I want. It's about me surrendering my will to God. And I know that you may not like that. But isn't that exactly what we see in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus, in his prayer, is saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's what Jesus taught us to pray in what's often called the Lord's Prayer. Remember that segment. Let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We recognize that God is in control and Jesus taught us to pray that prayer. And true prayer isn't about getting what we want. It's about surrendering our will to God. And Paul discovered that. And if really, if there's anyone who perhaps, maybe, you know, we recognize, man, if I'm going to answer someone's prayer, it would be Paul. All the years of service, all the things that he went through, everything that happened, and yet God says to him, no. He said, you know, my, you know and for you, you, your thorn might be a person. I don't know. Don't look. Your thorn might be a person. May, your, your thorn might be, you know, it might be a health issue. It may be a financial issue. I, I'm not sure what your thorn is, but I want you to recognize that we, as we submit ourselves, surrender ourselves to God, we pray about something, we realize that true prayer isn't about us getting everything that we want. It is about us surrendering to the will of God so that God can be glorified in and through our lives. We're praying, God, would you change this? God, I, I need you to fix it. Instead, God isn't fixing it. It's not changing, because prayer isn't necessarily about us getting what we want. It's about surrendering our will to God. Secondly, prayer reminds us that we are not in control, but keeps us close to the one who is. How many know that we need to stay close to Jesus? We used to sing that song, he's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. And when we pray and we seek his face, it puts us close to him. It reminds us, I can't control every situation, but it puts myself in in a position where I can receive from him who can sustain me and who can help me. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, New Living Translation says, three different times I begged the Lord to take away this thorn in my flesh. That doesn't mean that Paul prayed morning, noon, and for dinner. What it means is is that Paul, three distinct times, took time to seek God in specific intercession about this particular issue in his life. It doesn't mean that he prayed three different times all in succession. It means that three different times Paul sought God and said, God, I need you. I'm asking you to take this thing from me. In fact, it says that he pleaded with him. Significant seasons of prayer. And you might be in a, that kind of season where right now you're seeking, goes, God, I need you to move. I, I, I need you to, to bring about your, your power and bring deliverance in, into my life. I need a job. I'm willing to work, God, but I, I need a job. I need you to intervene. Just like Paul, we need to recognize that God is the one who is in control and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. 
Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And again, I know sometimes we go, well, you know, I really don't care for that kind of message because I want God to do what I want him to do. The fact of the matter is, is that God knows exactly what he's doing. And we think about Paul and, and, the, and, and the, the amazing guy that he was. In fact, the book of Acts tells us in Acts chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. And the diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. We're talking about a guy who had such an amazing anointing that they took towels from his, they, they had been touching him, and God used those to bring about amazing miracles. And here's this guy now saying, God, three different times, God, would you please take this storm, this thing that is striking me, this thing that is causing me pain, this thing that's afflicting me, would you take it away? And God says, no. I know that most people don't like this kind of message because it's sometimes not necessarily easy to hear. But what does God say to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9? The NIV Reader's Version says it this way. He says, he, what he said to me, my grace is what? Sufficient or all you need by Grace is all you need. So I'm very happy to brag about how weak I am. Then Christ's power can rest on me. Grace is so much more than just forgiveness. It's a connection with the God who can sustain us. It's not so much that we get everything that we want, that God can carry us through some of the most difficult elements of life so that people look out and go, how in the world can you continue to believe in a God who's let that kind of thing happen in your life? And you go, because I know who he is. And I know he's faithful. I know he's good. I know he's the redeemer. And I know that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. I'll be like, because ah, it's the name of Jesus. It's the gospel of Christ. It's not about us always getting what we want. It's about other people finding life in Christ. And there are many times that we don't necessarily understand. We, I, don't, I don't totally get it, but God, I choose to trust in you. I've talked about this a number of different times but in the book of John when Jesus is telling the people that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they all like flip out. And, like, and I know this is the not exactly version, but they're like, man, I, this is just a, they end up saying, this is a hard saying. Who can know it? And the Bible tells us that at that moment, a number of people leave. Jesus, instead of going, hey, guys, you really truly under, misunderstood what I was saying. Instead, Jesus turns to his disciples and said, so are you guys going to leave too? Well, what does Peter say? Lord, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of life. And I go, God, I don't understand why you don't perform a miracle and raise up a Tim Williams? I don't understand, God, why I'm at the bedside of my brother-in-law and I'm, God, I'm looking for an intervention. Instead of an intervention, I just see him getting weaker and weaker, weaker, rasping for breath, dying. I don't understand it, God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on. What am I talking about? I know, God, I still believe you are good because I do not interpret my circumstances you know, any other way than by your own goodness. You're, you're faithful, God. There's no one who can take your love away from me. God, freely extend it. We, you know, we, we have a tendency to say, God, this is what I need. You know what I'm talking about? God, this is what I need. What does God say? No. I am what you need. No, I am what you need. What you need is more of me in your life. What you need is more of the Holy Spirit taking control of you. What you need is more of my word. What you need is more of my grace and strength and love and purpose. What you need is me. 
And I can carry you through. And I can make you triumphant. I can, I can show to the world that I am God. And so God says, no, I, I'm what you need. I'm, I'm sufficient. How many, I know what I'm talking about. Have you had that happen in your life where you're like, I just don't understand it. I had a conversation with a Rebecca Williams speaking of. And she's like, Pastor, I, I, don't, I don't really get it. But I just want to say thank you so much for your care of our family and lives over the years. And all I want is God to be glorified in the midst of all of this. I'm telling you, that is faith. That is what it's all about. That is where we go, God, I don't comprehend, but I know that you are good. And God says to a Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And can I just tell you, I, I know that it won't necessarily change sometimes your circumstance, but it can change you in the midst of your circumstance. If you will pray and seek the face of God and continue to stand upon his word and continue to magnify and worship him, he can be the glory and the lifter of your head. He can be your sustainer. The Bible tells us that he's, he's the one who sustains, he, he, he's the one who anoints our head with oil. He's the one who causes our cup to run over. He's the one. Who prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so we trust in him and realize that he's able to do it. Because prayer isn't about getting what we want. It's about surrendering. Prayer reminds us that we're not in control. But it keeps us close to the one is. And the last thing I want us to, to recognize, prayer isn't just asking. It's trusting. Prayer isn't just asking, it's trusting. It's saying, God, I, I trust you. Because I, I, anybody know what I'm talking about? In fact, uh, Paul, writing to people at Rome, mentioned to us that sometimes we don't know what to pray for as we ought. He, Romans chapter 8. He tells us that by the Spirit we can pray according to the will of God. Because there are times we don't necessarily comprehend. We don't necessarily know what it is we need. And we're going, God, this is what I need. I'm convinced this is what I need. And instead, what we need to be going is, God, I'm standing on your promise, and I trust the fact that you're the one who's in control of my life. And because you are in control of my life, I will commit myself to you because prayer isn't about me getting what I want. It's about me surrendering to your will. It's about me staying close to you so you can sustain me. It isn't just about me asking for something. It's about me being willing to just say, okay, God, I trust in you. So have your way in my life. Have your way in the midst of the circumstance and the situation. Because how many know that no matter what took place in Paul's life, Paul's goal was that Jesus would be glorified. That he would be exalted. That the kingdom would come through his life. That people would see that he is the Lord and Savior. Because prayer, it is asking, but it's also trusting. It's going, God, I, I believe in you. And I, again, because I, I, I'm here to say to you, some people say, well, well, then what do you do? Well, I'm just here to tell you what I do is I pray and say, God, I believe that you are still Jehovah Rapha. You are still the healer. And I'm going to believe you for a miracle in this circumstance, in the situation. I'm going to trust in you, God. But at the same time, I realize it isn't necessarily me. It is you. So have your way in my life. Have your way in the circumstance. Be glorified in the midst of it because there might be a time in your life where it doesn't necessarily happen. And sometimes what Christian people do is, well, well if God isn't going to do it for me, then forget it. Well, if, God, if I don't get my way, then, well, I'm just gonna, then, then forget this whole thing. No, we recognize that God is always good and he's able to sustain us. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. He says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is saying, my ministry is, is so much broader, so much stronger now because I've learned to trust in him and allowed him to sustain me. 
Many of you perhaps have had the same kind of thing where you've experienced the power of God and he's able to lift you up and sustain you and encourage you and cause you to be a light in the midst of incredible difficulty and darkness. Sometimes people, instead of becoming better, they become bitter and go, God, I just don't necessarily understand it. 30 years later, they're still angry and bitter about something that God didn't do for them. Do you know anybody like that? Instead of actually surrendering to God, they're, they're just angry at God. And so, we, you know, it's not about us getting what we want. God knows what he's doing. And I, I don't know what you're dealing with. And I'm not here to say to you, give up. That's not my point. My point is, is that we realize that God knows what he's doing. And the point is, is that when circumstances of life seem to turn in such a way that it doesn't seem like God makes any sense, I can still trust him and keep moving and following after him and saying, God, I'm still pursuing you because you are the faithful God and eventually you are going to lift me up even if that lifting up is me standing in your very presence. Even if that lifting up is where I am delivered from this life into the next, but I don't necessarily know what you're going through, but what I do know is that God is good. If he doesn't do what you want, then realize that he understands and he he, he knows far more than we do. He knows the end from the beginning. His ways are so much higher than our ways. And when we're in the midst of that, we need to bring ourselves to him and realize that prayer isn't about me getting what I want. It's about me surrendering my will to God. It's about me getting to the place where I realize and remember that God is able to sustain me even in the midst of the greatest tragedy and difficulty. Anybody here ever heard about the Nazi occupation? Come on. How many know that there were believers? And there are still people who are being persecuted And being martyred today. Are you trying to tell me that somehow, some way, they have been disobedient to God and that's why that difficulty is happening? I refuse to accept that. But in the midst of all that, their ability to stand and trust in the grace of God. God is somehow, in, in some way, able to be exalted and magnified. And that's truly what it's all about. I believe that God is good. And I have seen him over and over and over again do amazing things, which is why I continue to believe, which is why when someone says, hey, I'm dealing with water, let's pray about it. Let's trust God. He's still Jehovah Rophe. He, he's still Jehovah Jireh. He's still Jehovah Shalom. He's still Jehovah Sidkin. He's the God who is the covenant-keeping God who can sustain you. Because he's our source of strength. And in the midst of that, we realize that you know, the, the, the prayer isn't just asking, it's trusting. And allowing him to speak into our lives so that he can be the glory and the lifter of our heads. His grace is sufficient. What am I saying? What I'm saying is, if it doesn't seem to make sense. It seems like maybe God is being uncooperative. I want to encourage you to trust him. I want to encourage you to say, God, all to Jesus, I surrender. I give my life to you, God. And I believe that you are able to help me be able to keep my focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Look at what we're just quoting. Who for the joy that was set before him did what? Endured the cross. Think about what we're just quoting. Our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Now sit down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become wearied and faint in your mind. And trust in him and go, God, I believe you're able to sustain me. And so if that's you today, I just want to encourage you. Just keep holding on to Jesus and trusting in his word. God is faithful and he knows exactly what we need. And he's able to bring what we need into our lives. And if he doesn't make sense, just 
keep trusting in him. Let's pray together. God, thank you. God, as we try to internalize some elements of these truths, that God's prayer isn't necessarily about us getting our way, but it's about surrendering our will to you. How we realize that prayer reminds us we're not in control, but you are. And help us be able to stand upon the promise, even when sometimes it doesn't seem to make any sense. Help us to continue to f- confess your word, speaking your word, believing, Lord, that you are the healer, believing, Lord, that you are the provider, believing, Lord, that you're Jehovah Nissi and it's under your bloodstained banner that we march and that we are victorious. You're Jehovah Shalom, the God who is able to give us peace. Oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that we could encourage. Maybe there's some people going through some difficult times, and it doesn't make any sense. I'm praying, Lord, that instead of giving up, Lord, they'll trust in you. We'll trust in you together, and together we'll continue to march forward, trusting in your great grace and your mercy, because your grace is sufficient for us.